brought this in this morning. I hope the cameras can get a good shot of it. It goes back about 42 years. Before we had digital photography, you'll get some better pictures in a minute. But it was the second best day in my life. 42 years ago, and I remember it well, the second best day in my life. And there was another day that I remember that, that, and it, that looked very much like this, except it was not in this natural setting. It was in a spiritual setting. It was standing in a parking lot of a very, very, very large 10,000-member church. And I was outside by the curb, not feeling worthy. And it was very much like this day. Another marriage. The best day of my life. Today, that day that I joined my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and became a part of his bride. I'm going to ask you, do, do you remember that day? Do you remember that day? You may be here, you may say, well, I really don't remember that day. Well, I will submit to you, you, you should remember that day if that day was the day. It should be a very special day to you. This was a very special day to me. My bride, I will say this, is beautiful. But my Jesus, my God, my God, my God. I want to talk about this day. Today, and I'm going to continue this morning in the Sermon on the Mount series. Got to skip back a little bit, and I told you that it would be a little bit broken as we uh, 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 injected a few more special sermons and special days. And just a reminder, we started in the Beatitudes, part one, and then part two, we went to Salt and Light. But I remember several weeks ago when I first started, I remember the date exactly, it was April 7th. I was praying, God, what segments of the Sermon of the Mount do you want me to preach in the same manner as I did in the book of Revelation? It's a lot of segments, and I knew I don't want to just take all summer to get this spoken. I wanted to say what he wanted me to say. And so I asked, what parts of the Sermon on the Mount do you want me to preach? And then he, he spoke to me, the Beatitudes. It gave me those salt and light. And then he began to speak to me concerning part of his sermon that was out of sequence. I had to jump over a couple of things. This was a month ago. The Holy Spirit seemed to, to bypass a few lines of the sermon and began to speak to me from the verses in the sermon subtitled in my study Bible, one word, and that word is adultery. Adultery. How many of you know this morning that Jesus desires a faithful bride? How many of you know that Jesus desires a faithful bride? He's looking for a, a ready bride, a bride that's, that's dressed and prepared, and he is coming for her. Come on, tell somebody he's coming for her. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. The amen is a kind of weekend here. If you believe that, say amen. He's coming for her. Part three, the mount, adultery. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now. I come, Lord God, right now in the, in the precious name of Jesus. With simply one simple, profound request. Your word be preached. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Your word, Lord. Not my word. I thank you, Lord, for Holy Spirit. 
this morning, Lord, the revealer of truth, the counselor, the teacher, the one that you said would always be with us, always be in us. So we lift him up this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So, Father, we come now this morning in the name of Jesus. Have your way. Say your say. In your precious name we pray. And the church said, amen, amen. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 27 through 30. Jesus is speaking on the mountainside to the multitudes at the beginning, the very beginning of his ministry. Not well known yet, but he's speaking to the crowds and he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks and a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart or her heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus was speaking that day concerning adultery in the human sense. But in actuality and throughout the, the Sermon on the Mount, he was not really speaking the human adultery. He was speaking to the spiritual. The Sermon on the Mount is a kingdom speech. It's a spiritual speech. And he does this throughout the Sermon on the Mount and throughout the New Testament. Jesus is introducing kingdom principles to the world by using their human experiences and their human understanding as real life object lessons. There's a divine order, church, to everything in the Bible and everything that Jesus said. First came the Beatitudes, the divine order, introducing his personality. Then came salt and light, revealing the assignment for us. And then Jesus said this, even though he skipped it over for this message. I'm going to hit it briefly. Matthew 5, 17, he said, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, Christ is saying, I am the fulfillment. From now on, he's telling the world, it's all about me. Everything that was in the past that you knew, it was all about me from the very beginning. And then he spoke this in Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said of the old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He's speaking to the multitudes. He's speaking to them about anger and resentment and resistance and rejection looking at the multitudes, because that is the, the eventual response of the unrepentant, unredeemed to the word of God. And that was for sure a lot of anger on that mountainside, I guarantee you. You see, they had come to see if Jesus was truly the deliverer, if he was truly the Messiah. They had come to see if Jesus was that, that next uh, conquering warrior king like King David that would destroy Rome and place Israel once again on top of the world militarily, religiously, economically as they once had been. They had come curious, could he be the one? And for many, if not most, church, the words of Christ did not satisfy their frustration. We know this because later in the Bible, almost all of them rejected his words and eventually crucified him. You see, there were a lot of things when I thought about it that Jesus could have chosen to address next in that sermon. He could have, he could have spoken about peace. He could have talked about patience. 
He could have talked about provision. They need all these things. He could have brought up Rome. He could have brought up a, a warfare. But he, instead, he went to a place that I am sure, put yourself there, I am sure no one expected him to go. The next thing Jesus addressed was the greatest sin in his people. From the moment the church was established at Pentecost to the latest church to open its doors today, and that is the sin of adultery. Quickly out of his mouth, after introducing himself, his personality, his ways, your ways, your assignment, a little bit about me being the fulfillment of the law of him, a little bit about anger. Now let me get to it. There's an a, a, a order in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about adultery. Not adultery in human marriage. He was talking to them about adultery in spiritual marriage. Where Christ is a groom and the church is his bride. The church universal that is biblically and expressly manifested through the local churches, that are biblically manifested in our households, which means that they are biblically manifested by you and in you and in me, the body of Christ. When Jesus is speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, as my wife reminded me recently, he was speaking to the multitudes. He was speaking to every generation that was old enough to comprehend language. He was speaking to every person that could comprehend Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek or Spanish or French or Gullah, Ubonics, Draw, whatever, whatever could be understood. He was speaking in that language. Whatever language is speaking on your mountain, Jesus is speaking to the multitudes one message. On the mountainside are babies and children and baby boomers and Gen Xers and Gen Zers and marrieds and singles and gay and straight and saint and sinners. They were all gathered on that mountainside. And on that day, Jesus stood on top of a hill near the city of Galilee and spoke to the multitudes about the sin of adultery, spiritual adultery. In the beginning passages of his sermon, because it was still about so much more. It was about love. It was about Christ and his bride. And his bride is the church. His bride is you, it's me, if you so choose to be. But there's still up to this persistent problem with much as his bride to be, and frankly, it's a problem with all of us at times. It's for me, a problem in me at times, it rises up, I guarantee you, it rises up in you. That's why Jesus spoke to us so early, adultery. Spiritual adultery. Look at the word of God penned by the Apostle Paul to the ancient church in Corinth. And it's to the churches today. They were at, and what was going on in this setting, they were attacking him, attacking the Apostle Paul for calling out their sin. And in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, he says, I hope you will put up with a little more of my foolishness. They called him a fool. Please bear with me. For I'm jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promise you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit 
than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believe. Adultery. Spiritual adultery. In that first church. Church, there can be no adultery unless first there is a marriage. Can I get an amen? Human marriage or spiritual marriage. And it is transferable to everywhere the Bible speaks concerning marriage. I want to look at Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And listen carefully. Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Church, a state of engagement is in effect between Christ and the church. Announced to the world before the Sermon on the Mount by John the Baptist. You might say that he was the best man. In fact, Jesus said that that none greater has been born of the woman than this man. And he said in John chapter 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. In the same way, the best man comes out before the groom. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands in him hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. He said, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let me talk you through marriage a little bit. For a marriage to exist, there must first be a man and a woman. By the way, that's the only way for a marriage to exist. Then comes desire. And a a, a powerful attraction. In the natural man, a man and a woman fall in love with each other. But in the spiritual, Jesus falls in love first. He makes the first move. And that first move that he makes is the cross. And then comes the proposal. I remember me to Mona, we came home from a date and we went in my mama's kitchen. And my mom and daddy, they were upstairs asleep. And I pulled out that ring and I got on one knee and I asked her, will you be my wife? I wasn't sure because she was threatening to leave town and take a job out of state. I think I was manipulated, but it was, it was all right. <laughs> that was my proposal to her. But in Christ, the proposal that he makes is the gospel. Accepting him as Lord and Savior by his atoning work, his atoning death, on the cross. 
Then come the vows. Can you put that first picture up? You got that upstairs? No second now. Then come the vows. Promises are made. A covenant is established. I made promises to her. She made promises to me. My John the Baptist standing on my left up there. Her sad daddy on the right. I won. He didn't, he didn't want me. Oh, no, that boy's trouble. Anyway, he was right, but anyway, got through. And then comes the placement of the ring. Come on, put that next one up there. The ring in the natural, but in the spiritual, that outward sign is the cross. It's the public sign of belonging to him. A spiritual ring of matrimony. And here's the question that could be asked for me today for this ring. By the way, it's the same one that she slipped on my finger. And darling, hold up your ring. Just hold up. It's not the same one I put on her finger. <laughs> Let's say it grew. <laughs> Expand them. You know, my little six hundred dollar on Mastercard ring ain't quite cut it. Anyway, took me a year to pay it off. <laughs> Did a spiritual ring of matrimony. But here's the question. Do you display that ring, the cross, every day and every night? Or do you take it off when your spouse isn't looking? When you do not want to be recognized as his. When you want to say or do things that he would object to. So you kind of slip it off. Can't even get it off. The Lord did that today. I can't even actually get it off. It's stuck. Feels good. Or have you actually left him, but you just wear it on a necklace? A piece of jewelry to look good. But if that ring is truly in place where it should be, then comes what's next, and what's next is intimacy. Come on, put that next picture up there. Yeah, baby. Yeah, little sugar. Time for the party then, and, you know. Yeah, so you go upstairs. Not really. <laughs> I'll stay on the word, okay, man. You see, in the natural, the marriage bed church is to be kept pure. But in the spiritual, spiritual, Jesus asked me this question. Who are you sleeping with? Who is satisfying your deepest longings? When in the privacy of your private space, who are you letting in? Who are you undressing for? Who are you revealing your, your secrets to? Where there's good news and bad news, church. The good news is Christ sees your nakedness anyway. And the bad news is Christ sees your nakedness anyway. So you might as well be spiritually intimate with him and then he will clothe you with righteousness. And then comes what's next, which is rejoicing. Come on, put that next picture up there. Rejoicing. Yeah.
in the natural. Come on, the party. But in the spiritual, the Bible says we rejoice in the truth. And then comes unity with each other, with each other, and in Christ. I'm going to put that next picture up there. Let's get on through the wedding pictures. I know y'all are curious. Yeah. Unity. In prayer. Fidelity in spirit, heart, mind, soul, and our bodies. Set apart to each other and to Christ. Oneness. Godly order in the home. Thinking the best of one another. Covering each other in times of weakness and nakedness. Building life together. Every part of each other needing every part of each other. And we work through disagreements that arise, but with the Bible as the rule book and the Holy Spirit as the referee. In church, adultery is forbidden. And the Bible says he is talking about the church. Church, there's a spirit of adultery that's at work in the church. And it's in work in every church. It's in every church since the first church. It's been at work in the first church up until today. And make no mistake about this spirit is a spirit from below, not above. And it's a spirit that that just like adultery in the natural, it's a spiritual that roams. It has a wandering eye. It is uncommitted. It cheats. It separates. It disunites. It criticizes the other. It lusts for another. It always craves something new and different. It destroys unity and it grieves the Holy Spirit. Church, we must always desire, listen, you should desire more than just being a person that loves Jesus. You should desire to be his beloved. I've counseled a whole lot of people who sat on that sofa beside me in tears because they had fallen in in adultery and they tearly confessed, but I still love my wife or I still love my husband that I cheated on. And I look at them with pity and sorrow because but for the grace of God, there go I. But thank God I learned from example, you can't can't be an adulterous bride and be not just love, but be loved. I want to look at the wedding invitation. I should have bought the invitation. We got that too. That's that's sent out. But wedding is coming soon. And the invitation is to that wedding with Christ have already been sent. So we're going to turn to my favorite book in the Bible again. I thought you were finished, right? The book of Revelation, chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And it reads after this, John heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting. That vast crowd is the saints who have gone before. Praise the Lord. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the murder of his saints. And again, their voices rang out, praise the Lord. The smoke smoke from from that city seems uh, ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God who was sitting on the throne. They cried out, amen, praise the Lord. And from the throne came a voice that said, Praise our God, all his servants, all who fear him, from the least to the greatest. And then I heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean of waves. Come on, the bride is big or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him. Listen, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. 
She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words that come from God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. This is John, fell, fell down at the angel's feet, but he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God just like you and your brothers and sisters who testify about their faith in Jesus. Worship God only. And I love this. For the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. This word of the Lord, this message, I ask God, uh, what's the action item? What do I do with this? What do we do with this? And I'm here to tell you this morning that the Lord said there is only one action item and no one can do it for you. Your pastors can't do it for you. Your church can't do it for you. I can tell you about God, but can I not do this for you? And listen, God will not do it for you. And that one action item is making intimacy with Christ the first priority in your life. In everything. And I found, I have learned even since then that this only comes one way. One way and that is through constant prayer. Not just a prayer, constant prayer. Not self-centered prayers. Not satisfy my will prayers. But prayers that always submit to this as Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will be done. Church, unity in the churches is never achieved and we do a lot of this by striving to get along with each other. Oh, we go and we learn, you know, conflict resolution and all this and what order this and all this. Those are things to treat the symptoms that come again, come again, and come again. Unity in the church is never achieved by striving to get along with each other. Unity in the church is found by each and every one of us striving for increased intimacy with Christ. Better listen to me, church. You may be asking, how, how does this work out in my life this morning? Good question. If you're praying right prayers and you're praying constant prayers, I promise you that will be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit concerning the uniqueness of your life. Listen, only the Holy Spirit knows the whole truth. Only he does. And when you have an intimate relationship with Christ, an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, he speaks He knows the whole truth. I can give you his word. I can give you some advice. But it would never really change your life if you don't have a very intimate relationship with Christ and the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to give you a tool this morning. And this tool came to me while just a couple of weeks ago, I was on the beach with Mona. And actually, I was by myself in that moment. And I begin just to read. I'm just going to read, just clear my mind. And, but I don't want to read any garbage. So I went to the religious book section and I said, give me something, give me something. And one of my favorite authors, I, I, I've only read devotional is all to all chambers. And I saw, I've never read one of his books before. 
And of course, I had this message on my mind, and I downloaded it on Kindle. I didn't get past a chapter before the Holy Spirit descended on me and said, you asked. Oh, my God. It was a book that's so impactful to me concerning oneness, unity. Okay, it's all about prayer, but it came oneness and unity. I cried with joy at the word so many times. And so I'm going to give you a tool. This is the best intimacy book I've ever had, read. The best prayer book, and it's not of prayers, it's about prayer. And I would have to say at this point, I think it is the best book I have ever read. And I want to invite the whole church to read it. Actually, I have the staff going through it as mandatory reading. And we're going through it one week at a time, and it is titled, make a note, If You Will Ask. It's short. It's, only, it's, only, it's less than 100 pages. You can do it. Hold it up, Jenny. If You Will Ask by Oswald Chambers. If you want real, oh my God, joy, satisfaction, unity, goodness, it has everything to do with marriage. Oh, not like this, see. She was marrying a man that was broken. The picture looked good. But he had a long way to go. He had addictions, problems. She's beautiful. I look good. But we were going to leave that place and go home to an absolutely roach-infested two-bedroom apartment. So many roaches, you can see them crawling in the light fixture. Seriously, am I right, Mona? You'll be eating a sandwich, and they're coming across the, the table, and you're pushing them back. It was that bad. It was turning $25 a month. But guess what? We didn't quit on each other. But there's one thing about Jesus. That groom is perfect. He's perfect, church. The ones that got the problem is his bride. It's us. If you don't have a problem, raise your hand. Got the right church. My goal, my press right now, here's my goal. I personally want to have a spiritual fidelity with you. In everything that I do and everything that I say. And that's what he wants from his church. He says he's coming, he's, he's coming for a, a, a church that has a spiritual fidelity, a clear sound, a clean heart. And that only comes by the blood of Jesus, and it only comes by prayer. And the day will come, the day will come when his bride is prepared. And then as that old saying goes, here comes the bride. And the bridegroom invites and waits 
and watches and he will come for his true bride without spot, without wrinkle, washed clean in his blood. Can I get a name in church? Lord, I pray right now that this word, Lord God, will press us closer and closer to you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that if there's any place in my heart right now, Lord God, that is of an adulterous spirit, in any of our hearts right now, if it's of, a, of an adulterous spirit, Lord, bring us, help us by the Holy Spirit, convict us, and bring us to a place of repentance. So your word called this an adulterous and wicked generation. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. I pray this in the name of Jesus. And the church said,